Outside of the government and political realm proper are other co-conspirators in the global secret combination. Among these co-conspirators are the so-called tech giants. These behemoths have become more than companies. They rival the power of national governments politically, socially, and economically, as Farhad Manju, tech columnist for the New York Times asserted in November 2017. Twitter and YouTube, which is a subsidiary of Google, can be added to the list of these important and powerful tech giants. Big Tech, as it is called, has asserted this power in politics worldwide, but especially in the United States. It is a well-established fact that big tech companies are silencing conservative voices through a variety of means, including outright censorship. The Conservative Media Research Center studied the issue and found rampant bias in the practices of Facebook, YouTube, Google, and Twitter. We decided it was time for a serious investigation into this threat. Our findings are irrefutable and shocking. Specifically, we found Facebook's trending feed has been deliberately hiding conservative content. YouTube moderators are removing videos that promote conservative political views. Google uses both their search engine and their video site YouTube to deliberately and aggressively promote liberal politicians and ideas while muzzling conservative viewpoints. Twitter has been the worst place of them all for conservatives, doing things like banning pro-life advertisements while allowing ones from pro-abortion groups. Most troubling is the ability of these companies to tamper with elections. Dr. Robert Epstein, a senior research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology, while testifying before the Senate, claimed that Google's manipulation of voters gave presidential candidate Hillary Clinton at least 2.6 million additional votes in the 2016 election. You testified before this committee that Google's manipulation of votes gave at least 2.6 million additional votes to Hillary Clinton in the year 2016. Is that correct? That's correct. Dr. Epstein asserted that Google was able to do so through bias on a massive scale in their search engine. Your testimony is that Google is, through bias in search results, manipulating voters in a way they're not aware of. On a massive scale. Facebook can also manipulate votes through a go vote reminder targeted at selected voters. And we know this without doubt because of Facebook's own published data because they did an experiment that they didn't tell anyone about during the 2010 election. They published it in 2012. It had 60 million Facebook users involved. They sent out a go vote reminder and they got something like 360,000 more people to get off their sofas and go vote who otherwise would have stayed home. Big tech companies will use their collective techniques and power to try to influence the 2020 election towards their preferred candidates and will do so in a big way. 15 million votes could theoretically be shifted without people's knowledge or any accountability. And, and looking forward, if I understood your testimony correctly, you said in subsequent elections, Google and Facebook and Twitter and big tech's manipulation could manipulate as many as 15 million votes in a subsequent election? In 2020, if all these companies are supporting the same candidate, there are 15 million votes on the line that can be shifted without people's knowledge and without leaving a paper trail for authorities to trace. These techniques, according to Dr. Epstein, an acknowledged authority in the behavioral sciences are invisible, subliminal, and more powerful than he has ever seen. And in 2020, 
you can bet that all of these companies are going to go all out and the methods that they're using are invisible, they're subliminal, they're more powerful than most any effects I've ever seen in the behavioral sciences and I've been in the behavioral sciences for almost 40 years. In 1961, in his farewell speech, the same speech where he warned of the military-industrial complex, President Dwight D. Eisenhower also warned the nation of becoming captive to a scientific technological elite. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. Unfortunately, that day has come, and this elite has become a powerful component of the global secret combination, intent on destroying the liberty of the nations of the world. The left has targeted education or indoctrination from the beginning. They have always had a long-term view and have used education from kindergarten to the university to inculcate their values and the rising generations. This is part of their playbook for seizing power and establishing a socialist state. America's children have been taught the principles of socialism since the beginning of the last century. It was John Dewey, a dedicated socialist and considered the father of modern education, who set the course for the socialization of America's educational system. Dewey and his successors, such as the National Education Association, have succeeded in turning the educational system into bastions of leftist thought, which in turn have convinced a majority of millennials into believing that socialism is better than capitalism. Indeed, the vast majority of professors at the leading liberal arts colleges are Democrats, outnumbering Republicans more than 10 to 1. With this amount of bias, it should be no surprise that colleges and universities have become active players in the conspiracy's fight to destroy the liberty of this nation and replace it with an authoritarian regime. They do so primarily through the suppression of conservative speech. And this problem of censorship as might be expected from a global enterprise, extends beyond the borders of the United States. Britain has the same problem in its universities. All revolutions must ultimately be financed, none are free. So too with the radical left's ambition to attain global domination. Radical leftist billionaires are more than happy to finance any organization or cause to further this ambition. All secret combinations are violent by their very nature. After all, they are organized to commit murder and rob to get gain. This is true of the modern secret combination. The radical left has a violent wing of its movement. In the United States, it's called Antifa.
In the United States, Antifa has become a de facto militia in the service of the Democratic Party, as Tucker Carlson rightly pointed out. This is a political militia that is doing the bidding, in effect, of Nancy Pelosi and Governor Jerry Brown and the mayor of Berkeley and all these supposedly mainstream Democratic politicians. And this is a militia hurting American citizens for saying what they think. Antifa is not confined to the United States. Antifa groups are active throughout Western Europe. Any conspiracy with global reach does not attain that capability without some sort of plan. It must be organized with its members fully aware of its objectives and how to reach them. The modern international secret combination, the radical left, does have a plan, which its members understand and have used for decades. We will call this their playbook. The playbook of the radical left, at least in the United States, is based upon the writings of Saul Alinsky, a community activist and political theorist. His most well-known political thesis is called Rules for Radicals, a pragmatic primer for realistic radicals. Alinsky's legacy is methodological. He identified rules and tactics for gaining power. Using a Machiavellian rationale, the ends justify the means. We know that both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are disciples of Alinsky and practice his tactics. Clinton knew Alinsky personally and wrote her college senior thesis on his theories. Obama spent his years as a community organizer in Chicago under the tutelage of Alinsky's disciples. Alinsky lived in Chicago and had a foundation based there. And since we are talking about the playbook, used by prominent figures in a secret combination, we should note that Alinsky paid homage to Lucifer in his book, known both to Obama and Clinton. Alinsky's epigraph at the beginning of Rules for Radicals is as follows. While we do not know of any direct connection between the adversary and the members of the conspiracy of the radical left, we do know from scripture that he is the father of all these conspiracies. While Alinsky developed rules and tactics for gaining power, the task for formulating an actual strategy fell to a husband-wife team of American sociologists and political activists Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. Called the Cloward-Piven strategy, the two called for overloading the welfare system in order to precipitate a crisis. In such a crisis and the chaos that ensued, a system of guaranteed income could be installed. In other words, socialism would replace capitalism. Cloward and Piven developed eight levels of control that must be reached before installing a socialist state. The first is most important.
These levels of control have been used by the radical left to varying degrees for decades. The policies and platforms of the Democratic Party are transparent articulations of these levels, including introducing a single-payer health care system, increasing the welfare state, enacting gun control laws, raising taxes, increasing the debt ceiling through uncontrolled spending, controlling public education, removing religion from the culture, and class warfare. Once these controls have been obtained, then a crisis can be precipitated to achieve the actual transformation of the system into socialism. For any revolution to occur, there must be an overriding crisis that compels it. A revolution, by its very nature, is a radical change to the fundamental political, social, and economic order. Change of this magnitude can only take place if the existing order is perceived to have failed and conditions have deteriorated into crisis. This is true of all the major revolutions of modern times. Crisis, then, is a prerequisite for the transformation of political and economic institutions. This is the sum of the Alinsky and Cloward and Piven strategies. First, seize control of the key sectors of America's or any nation's governance in society, and then create or take advantage of a crisis of sufficient magnitude to facilitate the revolutionary transformation. For the global secret combination to overthrow the freedom of all nations, it must transform the political orders of all nations and their global interaction. The new order must be, as it has been named, a new world order. This requires a crisis of worldwide proportions. For the worldwide secret combination to overthrow the freedom of all nations, there must be a crisis that is commensurate with their ambitions. There must be a crisis that spans the globe and puts every nation at risk. There are only a handful of such crises. The global deep state in this citation refers to the global secret combination. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic fits the criteria for a crisis sufficient to initiate the secret combination's plan to seize power globally. Currently, there are over 300,000 claimed dead in over 150 nations. As we shall see, the conspiracy is using this pandemic to forcibly take down national governments, especially in the United States, and install autocratic regimes in their place. The conspiracy, following the famous dictum of former Obama Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, never let a serious crisis go to waste, is using it to do things it normally could not do under normal circumstances. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. With the wide scope and fast pace at which the events surrounding the pandemic are taking place, we cannot provide an extensive blow-by-blow -blow account with any supporting evidence. Instead, we will outline the primary actions by the left and the principles on which they are operating. The rest should be clear for those who have eyes to see, while the willingly ignorant will remain so. First, it must be understood that before the COVID-19 crisis came about, the left had already attempted to remove President Trump from office repeatedly. The first attempted soft coup, the so-called Russian hoax, began when President Obama instructed his FBI boss, James Comey, to continue the spying on the Trump campaign so that Obama could act against Trump. It was January 20th, the last day of the Obama administration, Outgoing National Security Advisor Susan Rice sat down at her desk to write her final memo. Rice described the presidential transition, which had been underway for months. Then she wrote this.
During a meeting two weeks before, quote, President Obama said he wants to be sure that as we engage with the incoming team, we are mindful to ascertain if there is any reason we cannot share information fully as it relates to Russia. Now, Rice did not explain why Obama's staff felt it might not be possible to give intelligence on Russia to Donald Trump's staff, or for that matter, why the Obama people thought they had the right to withhold national security information from an incoming American president who had just won a national election. But Rice didn't need to elaborate. There was only one possible explanation for this. Donald Trump could very well be a Russian agent. Barack Obama himself said he believed that was possible. In Rice's words, quote, the president asked Jim Comey to inform him if anything changes in the next few weeks that should affect how we share classified information with the incoming team. Comey said he would. Now, what exactly does that mean? Here's what it means. The president of the United States turned to the head of the FBI, the most powerful law enforcement official in America, and said, continue to secretly investigate my chief political rival so that I can act against him. Comey's response, yes, sir. That's what Obama was saying openly. Secondly, deep stater Rod Rosenstein appointed a special counsel, Robert Mueller, to investigate Trump's ties with Russia. It was a frantic search for anything usable to impeach the sitting president. This effort failed as well. President Trump was battered and bruised by the ongoing spying and investigation, but not removed from office. The left then chose a more direct approach, impeachment. They had no real evidence of a treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors as required by the Constitution. Instead, the left chose to use a transcript of a call between the U.S. president and the newly elected president of Ukraine as an excuse to charge Trump with abuse of power, a charge not included in the Constitution as a basis for impeachment. In the end, the president was impeached, but not convicted. Having failed to remove President Trump or even neutralize his presidency and fearing the consequences of his likely re-election in November, the secret combination then decided to take the nuclear option, seize power through a global crisis before Trump could further disembowel their hopes of global domination. A pandemic was their best option. Of course, to create a pandemic, you need two things, a pathogen and a means to spread it globally. The pathogen must be highly contagious, such as a virus, and have no medical remedy, such as a vaccine. It must be, in point of fact, a biological agent that can be purposefully used as a weapon. Not everyone has a bioweapon on hand or the means to effectively spread it throughout the world. Generally speaking, only countries have these capabilities. Enter China. China may or may not be part of the worldwide secret combination, per se. Nevertheless, it is run by the radical far-left Communist Party of China, a party with ambitions of global domination and a common enemy in the United States. We know that the radical left in the United States has been intimately connected to Communist China for decades. As Secretary of State Clinton put it in 2009, China is not an adversary, but a partner. The pathogen of choice for the pandemic was created in the Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China. In early May, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo stated directly in an interview with ABC that there is a significant amount of evidence that the virus came from the laboratory in Wuhan. I can tell you that there is a significant amount of evidence that this came from that laboratory in Wuhan. The laboratory is a known bioweapon research facility Shortly after the outbreak, Chen Wei, an expert in biological weapons and a major general in the PLA, was appointed to head up the laboratory.
There is another, more disturbing narrative that suggests that the COVID-19 virus, designated SARS-CoV-2, is not novel, meaning new and unseen before, but is a product of genetic manipulation, first begun in the United States and then continued in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That is, it is a biowarfare capable pathogen with pandemic potential jointly created by the US and China. We know from Representative Matt Gates that the NIH funded the Wuhan Institute of Virology to the tune of 3.7 million in taxpayer funds for research into the coronavirus. Here's something remarkable and upsetting. The work in that lab, including its research into disease-carrying bats, was funded in part by you, by U.S. taxpayers through the National Institutes of Health. Hard to believe that's true, but it is. Congressman Matt Gates represents Florida. He joins us tonight to follow up on this story. Congressman, that's one of those stories that if you, if you had said that out loud a week ago, I think even I might have dismissed you as insane, but it's true. How did this happen? Yeah, I'm against funding Chinese research in our country, but I'm sure against funding it in China. The NIH gives this $3.7 million grant to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They then advertise that they need coronavirus researchers. Following that, coronavirus erupts in Wuhan. And then what's really troubling to me is that either conspicuously or miraculously, the Wuhan Institute of Virology is able to sequence the virus on January 2nd, but China doesn't admit to the virus existing to January 9th. And then the Wuhan Institute of Virology doesn't release this important scientific information to the world until January 12th. So at best, Americans are funding people who are lying to us. And at worst, we're funding people who we knew had problems handling pathogens who then birthed a monster virus onto the world. The funding provided to the Wuhan Institute was for gain of function research Gain-of-function research is research that studies the improved ability of a pathogen to cause disease. This necessarily requires genetic manipulation of the virus to improve its ability to cause disease. The objective is to assess its pandemic capability and develop medical countermeasures. Of course, this is a double-edged sword. The newly created pathogen can cause a pandemic as well as simply be studied. More to the point, any agent that can cause a pandemic, as these laboratory-created viruses can, can also be used as a weapon of mass destruction when used deliberately. This is the very definition of a bioweapon.